healing of human sexuality. This first teaching has to do with the purpose of human sexuality from a biblical perspective. Why did God make us sexual beings? What was he thinking of? <laughs> Why did he do that? Did he know what he was doing? <laughs> the answer is yes. A great idea. Sometimes it gets out of hand. So the Catholic Church uh, has a high respect for human sexuality as it is clearly laid out in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, but the sacrament of marriage. So God who created man out of his, out of love, also called him to love. And the an innate and fundamental vocation of every human being. Man was created in the image of God who is himself love. So as God created man and woman, their mutual love became an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves man. God looked at everything he had made and he found it very good. All the rest of creation he just found good, but when he created man, male and female, he said, this is very good. The Catechism chapter uh, 1605 says, may man and woman be created for one another. Holy Scripture says, it is not good for the man to be alone. The woman, flesh of my flesh, and man are alike. She is so close to him. God made her as uh, his partner, representing this way uh, the help that comes from the Lord. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become uh, one. May this be a steadfast union of their two lives, as the Lord himself uh, tells us regarding the origin of his Creator's plan. So, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. In Catechism, conjugal love involves a totality uh, in which all the elements of the person enters. Uh, appeal of the body, uh, an instinct, power of feeling and affectivity, aspiration of the spirit, and of will. Uh, it aims at a deeply personal unity, a unity that uh, beyond union in one flesh uh, leads to forming one heart and soul. In paragraph uh, 1661, the sacrament of matrimony signifies the union of Christ and the church. Uh, it gives spouses the grace to love each other with the love with which Christ loves his church. So God and sexuality. In the image of God, God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, let them have dominion. God created man in his image. In the image, in, in the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created man in his image and likeness. Male and female, he created them. Man was entrusted by God to act as his representative through the delegation of, of the power of lordship. He gave us to dominate over other beings, living beings, with intelligence and authority and subdue, subdue the earth. Man resembles God. God. Man is his reflection. That's how great man's dignity is, for you have made him only a little lower than yourself, than God's, crowning him with glory and honor. You have made him ruler over all the works of your hands. 
You have put all things under his feet, says Scripture. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground and, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And so man became a living being, literally a living soul. Adam was created out of clay, but not Eve. God made a man fall into a sleep, a deep sleep, and he pulled out of him the woman. She was built from a rib of the man. The way God created the woman is full of, of meaning and intention and reflects the role God gave to the woman. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. The woman was created especially for man. She is like his complement, a, a, a seamless and perfect fit. There is a, a close link uniting man and woman in a natural balance. This description illustrates beautifully the, the common origin of man and woman and their complementary characteristics. Man is always chasing that something that delights him, whereas the woman lives in the, in the nostalgia of the flesh from which she was taken. For the woman, there is a natural tendency to reunite with her original source and, and become one flesh again. And because Eve came out of him, this is why man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. It is clear that God intends man and woman to be in a heter heterosexual monogamous union. Eve completes Adam through companionship, friendship, and help. The story of the creation of man full of mystery and full of insights. Now, the word Adam doesn't mean man. The word Adam means the human being. So God takes flesh, takes uh, clay, puts it together, <laughs> blows on it. The breath of God, the Spirit of God, gives life to this clay and becomes a human being. And uh, God gives him authority over gives him dominion over his creation. And then God parades all the creatures he's made, the animals, the fish, the birds, before man, and man, the human being, gives them a name. He has authority over them. He names them. He's a, uh, God has appointed man the ruler of this world, the God of this world. That's us, We're man, the human being. And then God puts this human being in a deep sleep. Now, look what, look what happens. This is exactly what happens. In this human being, there is male and femaleness. They're both in this human being. And God puts him into a sleep, and he separates the maleness from the femaleness. And then he brings a woman to the man. Now, now it's the man, the male. And the male sees the female and says, wow. This is for me. <laughs> he clings. He's just attracted to this female. He said, wow, this is the flesh of my flesh, the bone of my bones. This is it. This is what I want. And so the man is attracted to the woman, and the woman is, is attracted to the man. She came. She was taken out of him. She wants it back. God created the human being. That's what he created. The human being is the male and the female together. The couple is the human being. We're drawn to one another. We're drawn to come, we're to leave our father and our mother. We're to cling to one another. We're to be united again. We need to be one. That's our destiny. That's our purpose. God made us this way. We're in his image. We're, we're in his image as a male and as a female. Sex isn't an accident, an afterthought of God. 
It's our, the basic design of human nature is male and female. We're called to be together. We're called to be drawn to one another. It's normal for a woman to be drawn to a man. It's normal for a man to be drawn to a woman. We're made that way. It's God's design that teaches about who He is, what God is. God is not a man. God is a spirit. And to show exactly who He is, who God is, He created the human being in two forms, a male form and a female form. But both of us represent God. We're in the image of God. And it's together that we represent who God is. It's in this coming together. It's this clinging to one another. This, uh, we're called to union. We're called to be one. We're called to bind together, the male and the female. It's the fundamental vocation of the human being to come together and... Uh, in marriage. It's our calling. God wanted to establish in our very flesh, in the very desires of our nature, the fundamental desire of our nature, who we are and what we're called to. God said it's not good for man to be alone. He wasn't referring to the male, he was referring to the male and the female. It's not good for the human being to be alone. We need more than ourselves. The man needs more than the male, he needs the female. The female needs more than herself. She needs the, ma the male. We are to come together because God inscribed in the very nature of the human being a need for the other. The perfect image of what heaven is, is the marriage. We are called to love. God, who is love, created us to love. It's our destiny. Because it's our destiny in God. Now, we had a beginning, but we will not have an end. We all had an origin. Each one of us had an origin. But we do not have an end. God, God granted us immortality. He created us as immortal beings because we're His children. And we're called to love Him forever. But on this earth, we don't see God. We're alone. It's not good for man to be alone. We're called to be with Him. But there's a, there's a time of testing. There's a time where we have to make a choice. Do we want to be with God or not? There's a time of this life. Who are you going to serve, says God. I'm calling you to be my children, says God. But to be my children, you must choose to be my children because it's an act of love. We decide to be with, with God. So that we're put in, in a space-time component where we have to decide who, who we're going to be with. It's not good for a man to be alone. We're, we're called to be with him for eternity, to love him, to be loved by him, to be fulfilled by him. And he, he put that in our very flesh this need for the other, so that we would know we need somebody else beside ourselves. We need, we need God. The woman, the man that we're drawn to is an, is an image uh, of our relationship with God forever. There is no sex in heaven. I'm not saying that. But there's a bonding in heaven with God, each of us. He really is our spouse. We really are the body of Christ. We're called to be with God forever. To be bound to Him in a passionate love that will never end. A total harmony between our beings. He inscribed that in our very flesh. Jesus and the church. Paragraph uh, 1615 of the Catechism, the second part. By coming to restore the original order of creation disturbed by sin, he himself gives the strength and grace to live marriage in the new dimension of the reign of God. It is by following Christ, renouncing themselves, and taking up their crosses that spouses will be able to receive the original meaning of marriage and, and live it with the help of Christ. This grace of Christian marriage is a fruit 
of Christ's cross, the source of all Christian life. This is what the Apostle Paul makes clear when he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, adding at once, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. This is a great mystery. And I mean to reference to Christ and his church. The Christian marriage in its turn becomes an efficacious sign, says the Catechism in, the, in chapter 16 17. The sacrament of the covenant of Christ and the church, since it signifies and communicates grace, marriage between baptized person is a true sacrament of the new covenant. God's ultimate goal in creating mankind, male and female, is to give us an insight into the everlasting marriage between God and his people. Human marriage gloriously prefigures the final union between Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. Paul identifies Jesus Christ as the second and last Adam. And just as the wife of the first Adam was taken from the side, his side while he was sleeping, rather than being created from clay, the bride of Christ, the last Adam, gushes forth from his side at Calvary during his sleep of death. And marriage prefigures pre precisely the relationship with God. Man and woman were created as one being and separated into male and female, and then united, reunited and complement each other, to be joined to each other physically, spiritually, to complement each other, and to be homologous to one another. That's why God became flesh, as man could be united with him who became his fellow creature and his equal. God becomes man so that man may become part of God through his intimate relationship with Jesus. This relationship with God begins here on earth but will never end. It's eternal. Marriage initiates a, a relationship between these two human beings that may become the relationship of each other, each of them, with God. It's the, the best image we have here on earth of eternal life with God is a beautiful marriage where there's tender love between the spouses. There is no better image of what heaven will be than when two human beings, a male and a female, love each other, tenderly care for one another, minister love to one another, care for one another, that is the, the exact image of what heaven will be. It will be blissful forever. It will be harmonious forever. It doesn't always turn out that way here on earth. But that was God's plan before we messed it up. But it's still God's plan. It could still happen. God still wants this. And His grace can make it happen. If we let Him. If we ask Him. It's still his plan. God doesn't change his mind. He's not like us. He's not fickle. He has the power to bring it about, and he wants to bring it about, and he will bring it about, and he has bring it, brought it about for those who enter into his plan and live it his way through grace. So what happens? What happened to man? Well, man rebelled against God. So his rebellious against God dislodged in man the source of his power, the source of his grace, the source of his harmony. He brought disharmony between him and God, and therefore he became disharmonious between himself, he and his spouse, he and creation. Disharmony was brought into the world. Sin is, the, is a lack of harmony. It's a lack of power to live gloriously, to live... Uh, abundantly with God. We're on our own when we split from God. We didn't have the power to bring it about anymore. We began 
seeking pleasure instead of union. There's a lot of pleasure in union. But the purpose is union, not the pleasure. The pleasure is part of the union. But yet you can't separate the pleasure from the union. All sexual deviations are a mockery of the actual role human sexuality is supposed to have in man's redemption and in achieving his ultimate destiny. They are gross distortions of the image of God in man. They are lies from hell, aiming to prevent people from giving glory to God by becoming intimate with Him in this life and in the life to come. Satan fights with all his strength to destroy human sexuality and marriage. He wants to pervert our sexual identities and ruin faithful marriages. He wants to desecrate the very image of God in us by defeating the greatest desire of God, that is, to give, to live a covenant of love with each human being. In marriage, the wife represents the love of Christ to her husband. In marriage, the husband represents the love of Christ for the wife. In every aspect of their relationship, it is God loving the woman. It is God loving the man through the woman. Caring for him, for her. It is God at act. Only God is good, Jesus said. Only God is good. Why do you call me good, says Jesus to the, to the rich young man. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. All the good in you is from God. And it's to be used for God's glory. When you give a, a hug to your child, it is God giving a hug to your child. He's chosen you to love the child in his name. When you love your wife, you're loving her in the name of God. It is God loving your wife. It is God loving the husband through the wife. Only God is good. The only thing that belongs to us is our sin. Everything else that is good in us is a gift from God. And God uses it. God, first of all, loves people through other people before he loves them directly. If someone is shut, refuses to receive the love of others because he's been wounded, he will no longer receive the love of God. Because God loves us through people firstly. Then, once we've opened ourselves to the love of others, then he can, through an intimate, through uh, a mystic experience, love us directly. But he won't do it if you're close to the love of man around you, and women around you. He won't. That's his basic thrust of love is through others. And sexual love is part of that. It's a mirror of our covenant with God. There's passion. God is passionate in his love for us. Just like a marriage is passionate in love for one another. There's courtship. God seduced. I've been through a courtship with God when I came to the Lord at 17. It was a courtship. He seduced me. And I was seduced. And I was happy to be seduced by God and to love Him, to be loved by Him. It was so beautiful. The surrender of the whole person into the other's trust and care. It's an exchange of vows, promises, commitments. It's a personal and interactive relationship. It's an intimate There are intimate moments of profound unity with total exchange of, of love, affection, mutual pleasure. The husband becomes one with his wife. And the wife becomes one with her husband. And it's a fruitful relationship. Life comes out of that, just like life comes out of God. Well, life comes out of the couple with children, because God's love is fruitful. And they transmit their humanity to their children through education, so through loving them, through being tender, by fixing boundaries for their growth. 
God has found a way of joining the fabric of his life with the fabric of the human being, like gold threads woven in plain cloth. Sexuality represents both the creation and the redemption of man. It reveals how we, the creatures, receive in ourselves a life in the image of God, thus contributing to the nature of God by becoming co-participants of the life and nature of God. Scripture says, His divine power has bestowed on us everything that makes for life and devotion through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and power. Through these, He has bestowed on us the precious and very great promises so that through them you may come to share in the divine nature after escaping from the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. Our sexuality can be healed. God wants to heal it. God wants to restore us to be in harmony with ourselves and and with our spouse. But there's a battle going on. A battle for concupiscence. The church offers us guidance in this battle, in this work towards victory over ourselves, our sexuality. We find it in the Catechism around paragraph 2520. Baptism confers on its recipients the grace of purification from all sin, but the baptized must persevere in the fight against concupiscence of the flesh and the disordered lustful desires. With the grace of God, he overcomes them by the virtue and gift of chastity, by purity of intention, by purity of vision, external and internal, by discipline of feelings and imagination, by refusing all complicity in impure thoughts that make us to turn away from the path of God's commandments, the sight of which arouses yearnings in the senseless man, by prayer, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God, sanctified, called to be saints. Christians have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Son teaches them to pray to the Father and having transformed their life, prompts them to act, to bear the fruit of the Spirit through charity and action. Healing the wounds of sin, the Holy Spirit renews us interiorly through a spiritual transformation. He enlightens us and strengthens us to live as children of light through all that is good and right and true and everything. That's the Catechism, chapter 1655. What a plan. What is the foundation of sexual healing? Do you want to be free from sexual slavery? Well, this is it in a nutshell. It's a long process, but this, this is it in a nutshell. Strive for a loving intimacy with God himself. That's the secret. Then he will show you the way to follow. And in collaboration with your free will, he will transform you into the very image of his beloved son. The arms of God are the only place where you can profoundly see the meaning of your life, your vitality and your joy, and are also the source of all the desires and powers to accomplish the will of God in an intimate, loving relationship with Him, in the love of a child for His Father. It is there, only there, that all your doubts and all your fears all your needs and all your desires, all your hopes and all your joys find resolution and fulfillment it's in the arms of the Father. The arms of the Father are Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That's, those are the arms of the Father. It's only there that you get sexual healing. Here's why. Alone, you're unable to do anything that holds eternal value. The more you try to do it on your own, the more you block God to act in you and for you. 
If you try to do it on your own, on your own, through your flesh, God will let you try. And as long as you try, you'll fail. Because you can't fight the flesh with flesh. You fight flesh with grace, not with the flesh. Your will won't do it. It's grace that'll do it. You are completely dependent on God to instill in you the desire and motivation to accomplish in any and all good things and also to equip you to accomplish it. You must pray to God to grant you what you lack and respond to the grace He gives you in a positive way. Your goal is to live completely for the glory of God. The start and finish of all you need to do is summarized this way. Pursue a relationship with the God who saves you, who heals you, and has a future for you. To get there, you will have to devote time to develop an intimate relationship with the Lord, learning to hear His voice and to obey Him and learn how to allow His power to triumph over your problems for you. When God shows you the path to take, He also sends you His Spirit to support your obedient response, rendering it effective. You know, the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous is right on target if you understand them properly. These are four of the steps. Just listen to them, and you'll say they're right on target. To break any kind of addiction, including sexual addictions, it's right on target. It says, we admit, we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol. Two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. That's right on. Number three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. And finally, number 11 of the 12 rules, the 12 steps, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contacts with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Now, this is right on, but you must understand that the, the, the two founders of uh, the 12 steps were talking about Jesus Christ. They weren't talking about a tree or Buddha or the stars or a rock or something, God as you understood Him. They were talking about Jesus. There's only one God. There aren't two gods. There's only one. And source of power is only in God, through Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. There is but one God, only the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is God. And He alone is the source of victory over sin. Our good intentions and the strength of our desires will not bring us a long-lasting healing. A truly healed person is compelled and strengthened by the Holy Spirit to resist the temptation of sin through the love of God in his heart, which is manifested by an intimate relationship with the Lord. To the one who is able to keep you from stum stumbling and to present, to present you unblemished and exultant in the presence of his glory. Only the power of God at work in someone is able to free them. The source of the inner emotional need to sin and possibly its satanic stronghold were supernaturally removed by God. That's the only source of deliverance, long-term freedom from our sexual drives that are out of control. So I want to propose to you a therapy of different steps the first step is, who is God? second step, who am I? I'll go through the different steps very briefly, and I'll come back to them again as we, uh, as we keep this teaching. You'll, but first I want to give you an overview, so I'll be passing pretty quickly over these, these issues. I'll be coming back to them to see them more precisely. So first step, who is God? That's a therapy to discover who is God. It's the first step to being healed of our broken sexuality. There are some truths you should believe, first, about God, and secondly, about yourself. The first step, who is God? The second step, who are you? And the third step of this therapy 
which is hinged on the truth, consists in learning the ways the Lord has established for us to interact with Him and putting them into practice. So the source of all sin is the belief that God is not good. That was the temptation given to Adam and Eve. God told them, don't eat this tree. Don't eat the fruit of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they went along their path, and the devil came along and said, can you eat everything? Did, did, did God forbid you to eat everything? He said, no, 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 we can eat everything except that one tree. And why is that? Well, God forbade it. Because if we eat it, we'll die. <laughs> the devil said, die? Are you kidding? Don't you see what he did? He doesn't want you to be like him. If you eat that fruit, you'll be exactly like him. He's keeping something from you. He's like that. God is like that, you know. You can't trust him. That's the doubt that was put in man at the very beginning. We still all have that doubt. You can't trust God. He's evil. His intentions, we don't know them. And he's, he's got a, this dark plan. And uh, if you, you follow him, you're going to get hit pretty hard when you don't expect it. That's a, what the devil was saying. And they believed him. They trusted the devil instead of trusting God. That's the problem. We trust the devil but we don't trust God. So as soon as you trust the devil, not God, you've shut God out. God only acts if you trust him. It's on faith and faith alone that God will give you his promises. This idea, this seed of doubt, comes from the devil. You must instead meditate on the following truth and decide to believe them. So these are the truths for who is God. God is all-powerful. God is humble. God is love. God is wisdom. God is perfect. God is always present everywhere. God draws you to Christ. God directs your steps. God instills in you the desire and the deeds. He's in charge. He's powerful. But who are you? Well, who are you? Why are you here? Does God have any... Does, does God love you? Many have been led astray by believing the enemy's lies concerning their own essence and destiny. Instead, to be healed and delivered from the bondage of sin, we must consciously and constantly fix our thoughts on what the Word of God says about us. Even if those truths contradict our feelings, our emotions, and even our experience, in doing so, God will grant you the faith to believe in what you cannot see, and in what you have not experienced. So who are you? Well, we are exiles in this world. We are the children of the kingdom of God. We are soldiers in the army of God. We are a gift from the Father to Jesus. God gives us the grace. We choose to take it or not. The purpose of our life is to praise and glorify God. By fixing our eyes on Jesus, we receive the power and the necessary grace to love and obey Him. Love is the right motivation for everything we do. The third step of this therapy is practicing the truth. If God said it, you do it. Not because you understand it, but because God said it. That's faith. It's not based on understanding. It's based on obedience. We're called to the obedience of faith. We need to learn the ways God set for us to be in communion with Him and to put them into practice. So fix your heart on the Father and against sin. It's like a sailor who uh, wants to go on a trip and he's in his boat. Now he can use his oars and he'll get there slowly if he does get there or he can just hoist the, the sail. And if he hosts the sail and the wind comes along, with the, the, the wind will just glide him across the destination. Well, hosting, raising the sails is putting your trust in God and doing what he says. And the wind is the Holy Spirit. You submit to God, you do it his way, and the Holy Spirit will bring you to destination. Seeking God diligently with all your heart. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Seek the Lord and receive in you the attributes of the Lord, His power, 
and his plan for healing and victory in your life. Not by power, says the Lord, not by might, but by my spirit. That's how God does things, by his spirit, says the Lord. Now, rebuke the temptations to make it on your own, through your own efforts and fight. You cannot overcome sexual temptation with your will. As you try, as you push down these urges in you, you're just giving them more strength. You're, you're giving them muscle to come back later and really throw you for a loop. It's by grace that you get victory. Let it be clear in your mind that God is the source of everything. When things go wrong with you, make a conscious effort. Assume the best about God. Choose to believe in His love, His integrity. Be conscious that the fault lies elsewhere, certainly never in God. Pray for an unfailing faith. Pray for God to reveal Himself to you and for an intimate journey with Him. Pray for the desire to be like Him. Pray to receive in you the love that the Father has for His Son, Jesus. Be persistent. Keep yourself in check so you do not trick yourself into believing that you want to be purified and delivered by God when you actually do not want it. Be honest. Decide to believe by the grace of God and to live by it instead of trying to merit His favor. Fourth step of this therapy. To come to God, your Father. Now, this is eternal life, says Jesus. Eternal life is that they should know you, Father, the only true God, and the one, the one whom you've sent, Jesus Christ. Many people enslaved by sin do not love God. They blame God for the problems in their lives. They perceive him as a severe judge with a, a whip in his hand. He's cold. He's manipulative. Satan has painted a grotesque picture of God in their minds, making God look like an angry God who demands the impossible from them, and then he throws them in hell because they failed. Many people are convinced that God hates them. That's why they rebel against him. Their rebellion is their statement that God is unfair. I've met people like that. They tell me. That's why they sin. They're rebelling against God because God doesn't love them. That's how Satan convinced us to rebel against God, by weaving a complex web of lies that leads us to believe God does not exist. Now, the true God is completely different from this. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, says Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Do you find Jesus loving? There is a oneness in nature between the Father and Jesus, but a distinction of persons. The Son is the splendor of His glory, of the Father, the very imprint of His being. Jesus is the perfect reflection of the Father's glorious light. Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. He is an exact imprint of the Father. He's like a seal of the Father. God is infinitely beautiful and good. His presence inebriates us. It gives us life. His presence makes us euphoric, drunk with joy. I've met people who were drunk with God. They couldn't walk straight. They just couldn't. They were drunk with the love of God. That's what God does. He has that effect on you. He made us to be like that when we're in, we're in His presence. The human being has been created in such a way as to be seized by the presence of God. The very purpose of our existence is to be seduced by and cling to the heart of God, to fall madly in love with Him who loves us totally. We are deeply programmed to let ourselves be intoxicated by God, to be passionate for Him, to not to be able to exist without Him. God create, created a dependency 
an addictive effect in his creatures. In him, all our dreams, all our desires, all our aspirations come true. He's the fulfillment of our most deepest dreams. He is infinite love and goodness and beauty. His splendor, His majesty is overwhelming. May the eyes of your hearts be enlightened. May you know what is the hope that belongs to His call. What are the riches of glory in His inheritance among the holy ones? And what is the surpassing greatness of His power for us who believe in accord with the exercise of his great might. The discipline of the Father is redemptive and very different from the punishment brought about by the devil. The Bible teaches us that God simply delivers his rebellious children into the hands of their idols, often called lovers. Therefore, says God, I handed her over to her lovers, the Assyrians, for whom they had lusted. Satan attacks us through self-condemnation and self-defeat. God never acts that way. God does discipline us. We're called to be intimate with the Father. The the fifth step, now to be able to grow in this love, as we will see, I'll be going through all this again, step by step. I'm going through fast now to get an overview of how you're healed. It's a process. It's not a magical pill that you take on uh, Monday morning. It's a, it's a process. You join a, a group of devout, balanced, and sound Christians, prayer group, a Bible study, whatever. You commit to read the Bible every day. You go to the sacraments as often as possible. Whatever gives you grace, you go for it. Living by grace. The problem is that love cannot be earned. Holiness, the forgiveness of our sins, perfection, acceptance, God's favor, none of these we get because we deserve them. They're all free. They're gifts. Jesus has merited them for us all. He offers them all to us free of charge. Because he loves us, we get them by grace. The world teaches that the purpose of human life is achieving position, power, pleasure, prestige, and possessions. All those things are obtained through performance. The world glorifies and publicly elevates those who succeed. We're a society where we adulate our stars, sports stars, TV stars, those who've achieved, great scientists, we acclaim these people. We adulate them. We love to be in their presence. The Lord asks us to reject these five gods. Do not love the world or the things of the world, says the Holy Spirit. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, sensual lust, enticement of the eyes, a pretentious life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Yet the world and its enticements are passing away. But whoever does the will of God remains forever. So we must learn to live by grace. Satan knows that the deepest desire of God's heart is to maintain a close relationship with his children. Wanting to deny it to God, the devil pushes Christians to performance, orientation, as a diversion. He pushes them towards activities for the Lord in order to merit the favor of God. The most important thing for Satan is to stop Christians from spending a lot of time in God's presence so as to prevent them from falling madly in love with him. He'll distract you by working for God instead of working with God. Now, God's grace acts slowly, but deeply and powerfully. It takes time. The arms of God transform 
my heart slowly but surely. The arms of God are the arms of the one I love most in the world. Remember now, the arms of God are Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The Father has two arms. And when he takes us into his arms, it's through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And that's how he crushes us against his heart to have us become one with him. The one I want to spend the rest of my life with, just being in his arms, brings me peace. Fear and anxiety vanish away. I'm loved. I do not want this moment to end. After my failures, I go back to his loving arms to be cleansed and forgiven. It is in his arms that my heart is appeased to the point that my desires and rebellious impulses fade away. Intimacy with God transforms my heart slowly but surely. Grace is victorious. After committing a sin, even the 10,000th time that I've committed this sin, any notion that God is angry with me, that God is resentful or disappointed or wants to punish me or does not approve me anymore, that God does not love me, are just temptations, lies from the devil, trying to prevent me from throwing myself into the open arms of the Father and receiving abundant kisses from his lips that always smile at me when I come back to him. His grace is unconditional. His grace and unconditional love are what persuades me more and more to be faithful next time temptation comes my way. My sins will decrease because of His grace and His love. Over time, His grace will preserve me from sin. Now, this grace is not without cost. It doesn't cost anything to me. It's free. But it costs Jesus a lot. It costs the Father a lot. It costs Jesus his life. God does not give it away casually. He gives it only to those who totally understand its value and who desire, who desire it with their whole heart. And that's how you get into a transformed heart. Receive the Lord Jesus in your heart. Accept his grace, forgiveness of your sins, which he offers you unconditionally. Say to God, worthy or unworthy, here I am, Lord. Start your transformation immediately by breaking from your tendency to focus on performance. Fight until you obtain that grace. Do not give up. I will not let you go until you bless me, says Jacob. That's how we pray too. Make love the root and foundation of your life. Practice believing in your heart the promises of Scripture. Delight in weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, constraints for the sake of Christ so that God's power may rest on you. Choose well which tree you will feed from. Feed from the tree of life. That's Jesus. Enter willingly into the spirituality of praise. That's one of the secrets. When sexual temptation comes along, any temptation comes along, you renounce it, and you don't fight it. You renounce it, and you go straight to glorifying God. You go straight from the temptation directly to praise, because God inhabits the praise of his people. And as you begin to praise God, his presence comes on you. And the temptation just flies away, and you're free from temptation. It's the spirituality of praise that gives us victory, because it's through praising God that he inhabits us, and we get victory.